Hello everyone, I'm Gemma Starr and welcome to another episode of Heart Warriors. Heart Warriors is a series I've been guided and inspired to do thanks to my energetic connection with Kata Judah. Kata Judah is this beautiful rock formation behind me in Central Australia, very close to Uluru, which is our sacred feminine side. And Kata Judah is the sacred masculine side and the inspiration behind this series. So what I'm here to do is to interview 100 men. And today we are up to number 96. Um, and uh, give them a platform to share their journey into the heart. Their highs, their lows, tools, practices, insights, wisdom. What got them from their rock bottom moment into being the heart warriors that they are today? Today's guest is a man living in Costa Rica, and his name is Kyle Anker. Now, Kyle is a transformational coach, and he's also a medicine guide. Um, he loves supporting the evolution of the masculine with ancient plants, modern psychedelics, and a big curious heart. And really excited to be chatting to Kyle and hearing all about that journey into the heart. So, Thank you for being here and enjoy. Kyle Anker, hello. How are you today? I'm very good this evening. How are you, Gemma Star? <laughs> very well, thank you. And I read on your profile you live in a little shack in the mountains of Costa Rica. How's that lifestyle? That's right. I live in a cabin in the jungle on a mountain in Costa Rica, and it is absolutely idyllic. Right in front of me, looking out the window behind my desk, I see clouds just rolling through the jungle. I live in what is called a cloud forest, about 4,000 feet above sea level. Sounds absolutely amazing. I bet the energy there is just, um, you know, magnetic, beautiful. Awesome. Well, let's see your, hear your story and see how you got to be the man you are today. So I like to start off with asking you who you are inside when you drop all your external labels of coach and mentor and medicine guide. Who's the man inside? Mm -hmm. Yeah, with all the labels, all the doing, all the defining I am an adventurer and in doing so seeking truth and exploring the world while I do that. But adventurer is really what it comes down to for me. Yeah. I like that. Just to maintain that curiosity about everything. And, you know, that's, that's a beautiful um, awareness so going back to your childhood, what would you say was your major challenge growing up? Hmm. Well, there were quite a few, but I would say growing up, the major challenge was trying to figure out what to do with myself. I had a father, but he wasn't much of a guide per se. He didn't fill that mentor role that many fathers used to. So when I was approaching the end of high school, also being the first in my family to aspire to go beyond, to go to college, I quite wasn't quite sure what to make of myself. And <clears throat> so that was a challenge. Another challenge was I didn't quite like fit in anywhere. I found myself. I had a nice group of friends and I was rather sociable the kind of person that moved between different groups of different types but I never quite knew my place I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere so what I decided to do knowing that the father I suppose on some subconscious some visceral level was meant to be the the archetype for me the thing to follow almost like well if that's my dad and he who divorced, well, my mother divorced him because he cheated. If he wasn't showing up to be the father figure that I wanted, that would have been helpful. And he's doing these things. 
<clears throat> I suppose I'll do the opposite. That's the best I can manage. And he worked on cars and went to bars and rode and built motorcycles. So I'm like, I guess I'll go into technology and study computers and information science. It's kind of how it started for me. <laughs> yeah. But I will add one more little piece, which adds uh, some flavor to this idea of me being an adventurer. I spent a lot of my time alone reading fantasy novels, playing fantasy science fiction video games where these parties of friends go on adventures to heal, to transform. And this is what really saturated the material of my youth, the hero's journey over and over and over, epic saga after epic saga. So this is something important to note because it's at the bedrock of who I am. And I firmly believe that which we surround ourselves with, that which we consume with joy and positivity and clarity in our youth, it becomes us. How is a different story, but it becomes us. Do you know the how? Well, I believe it's always there. But a matter of how authentically it shines through has to do with how much you allow your genius to show, how much you learn to trust yourself and to express your highest truth. So say someone who wanted to be a ballerina when she was young and she grows up and finds herself in some cubicle office C somewhere. She's still that person, but she's like trapped in this alternate reality. And getting in touch with that truth is what will set her free. That's how I see it. Right. So with these um, alternate realities, do you think that um, we can align ourselves in frequency to different realities and ultimately manifest in those? Is that how we create our reality? Or do you think that, you know, what we're seeing now is our reality and that's pretty much how it is? I say a little column A, a little column B. I know for sure that what we're seeing isn't the only reality, isn't it. And I do believe that we can access different aspects of this reality, different components of it, different ways of perceiving it through psychedelics and plant medicines, which is my purview. And then there's the question of what else is there? Well, I believe enough in what we know about quantum physics that there are multiple iterations of life happening at the same time and time and space is kind of an illusion which is hard to not believe after going on enough deep journeys with these plant medicine allies but as far as manifesting it you know this word gets bandied about quite a bit <clears throat> yes and it takes a lot of work clear concerted directed intention and integration in this work and being focused and clear and steady on that over time, time under pressure, as many physical trainers will say, when you're training a certain part of your body, the same goes for the spirit and for the soul. Your know, time under pressure with consistent action. Yes, we can change our reality. We can change who we express as and what we do in this world to great vast degrees. And I believe there are constraints within which we can operate. Some might call that, you know, uh, our life path or our dharma. And some might say we're saddled down by ancestral burdens or ancestral karma. And there's only so much we can change. But while there is some truth to that, I believe, I'm not interested in finding out how little or how much. I'm just concerned about that we can and how should we do it. And how can we do that safely and powerfully? I'm interested in what you said about uh, your psychedelic experience. What did you see um, through psychedelics? What did you come to understand? Mm, so much really depends on the medicine. So I started my journey with intentional use that says intentional use with ayahuasca i had bandied about in the festival scene with lsd and mdma and some mushrooms here and there like felt varying degrees of different state 
But it wasn't until I started intentional usage that I began to discern how they could be used for different modalities, different healing. <clears throat> hmm. I want to start with MDMA because I haven't really dial in what ayahuasca can do for much later. MDMA, I believe, is one of the most important medicines in the world right now since it is one that does not bring up any extra baggage because we all come to the table wanting to work with these medicines with something we want to heal, something we want to be better with, something we want to accept and make peace with. And MDMA is largely what I consider integrative medicine. It helps you be at peace with what is there to love that, to fall back in love and in trust with yourself. And if you pair that with skilled therapy or transformational coaching with someone who has worked with you for some period of time up until that point, and you engage in dialogue around that material during the journey, you can significantly rewrite that story in your mind and develop a different relationship with that trauma and those people involved. So that medicine, it brings you back to the joy and the innocence and the purity of your early life, of your true self, of that brave and courageous adventurer. That medicine is the one that I start my work with, with anybody who's new to this realm of growth. Then I could say <clears throat> mushrooms. Mushrooms are quite complex. They're often referred to as the inner child medicine. And I believe it's because they accurately represent the state of your inner child when you come into ceremony with them. I've had the most blissful experiences in my life with mushrooms and the most terrifying ego deaths. But what really stands out for me with them there's something very earthly about them. And what I mean by that is when you find yourself engaging this reality around us under the allyship and the support of mushrooms, you can see the other layers of what's happening here. So what I mean by that, I'll give an example. I once got up from a mushroom journey circle I was in and it's outdoors in Hawaii or on the soil, you know, underneath the starry sky and I got up to go to the bathroom in the woods as I came back I saw the shimmering canopy of light that was around the circle of aspirants and the guide I thought it might have just been some tricks of the eyes some some artifacting so I kind of looked around to other spaces and nothing but it was there straight ahead and then it kind of just hit me I'm like I know what I'm looking at like this is that circle of protection that we call in before we do our work whether it's from the land or the spirits, like this is us <clears throat> being protected by this magic, by these allies that we make a compact with in this work that we ask to help us. And I've also seen auras on people under the influence and support of mushrooms and felt the life in the plant matter around me in ways that no other psychedelic could offer. So I'll just... I'll keep it to those two for now, because those are the two I primarily work with in my practice. When you said, spoke about ego death, what does that look like? How does that come through as an experience? Hmm. <clears throat> well, I think the best way to describe an ego death is to turn the conversation over to 5-MeO DMT which is a variant of DMT that comes from uh, bufo toad, or it can be synthesized through a, a grass, a reed called phalaris, I believe. Anyway, much different than standard NN DMT, which is usually just referred to as DMT, which is like the yellow submarine variety. This medicine is designed to give you an ego death and reliably, offers experiences of, of source, God, primary religious or primary spiritual experiences, which come after the ego death. So when I first tried 5-MeO-DMT, <clears throat> what I recalled after taking the medicine and following the instruction to hold my breath and just like hold it as long as I can 
was this it's kind of like the old tube televisions when you turn them off and they kind of go pinhole it was an experience kind of like that like i just felt my senses kind of closing in and then there was a feeling in my body starting from my fingers and my toes as if it was closing and folding in like a dying flower and as it continued to fold in through my heart that was the last breath i remembered taking but after that moment there was still something to experience though there wasn't this familiar feeling of breath coming and going of a body breathing but after what i felt like my body collapsing through myself there was this gentle blossoming of life and my vision was completed with these perfect beautiful sacred geometrical swirlings and one in each corner and one in the center bright whites and yellows and blues not unlike some of the great visionary art you see out there in festivals and it all felt like love and it was all complete and still and infinite there was nothing to fear there and the sense of what i could take in at that point was this is me as a moat of consciousness in the sea of all life a great equalizer I will say that one other time I took it, it wasn't as successful as a journey into that space. What I noticed was this, almost like there was a ball of energy kind of moving around my body because the dose I took wasn't enough. And wherever that ball was, it's like my life there disappeared. It's like I was halfway to the point of my senses my sense of self my consciousness being turned off and that was incredibly uncomfortable but upon coming back to consciousness each time you get the gift of slowly noticing parts of yourself kind of coming back into place like puzzle pieces falling into the hole and if you stay present and aware with that process you get to witness these parts of you and from this place of equanimity and curiosity just like notice okay that part you serve me well that part i'm keeping an eye on you and it just helps to see what makes you what puts you together okay thank you for that so i'm interested in um is do you recommend plant medicine for everyone's spiritual path mm. how does one mm. know if it's the path to go down for them or not because personally i've never i've never done any of that the plant medicine so you know i'm generally interested but i also don't feel that i need it yeah it's a really really good question if you asked me <clears throat> about a year ago i would have said immediately that it is not for everyone <clears throat> some people are not ready and won't be in this lifetime and something in me shifted in that opinion recently and i feel like under the right conditions and with the right medicine and the right community <clears throat> everyone could benefit and I'll, I'll tell you what brought me to that space it was this conversation i was having with a <clears throat> excuse me a colleague of mine around why integration is important. You see, we Westerners are unlike the indigenous in a particularly important way, which makes this art of integration, of making sense of our experiences with plant medicines and psychedelics, makes it very important to us because we are detribalized. We don't have a relationship with nature. We don't have a relationship with community. We don't have elders and seers and guides that we can go to that can take us through these rites of trials and initiations, rites of passage rather. And that is what creates 
a formula for, for safety and for efficacy in this work. <clears throat> now, not every facilitator or guide has all those pieces of the puzzle together for every person or group they take through this work. And sometimes that's okay, depending upon the preparedness of the person coming to the work. That said, I feel like with the right communal variables, everyone could have a positive experience. Though right now, it would be challenging to create that for everybody, I believe, really challenging. And the reason why I say it would be helpful for everyone too at a very essential level, because we are people in pain, carrying great trauma. It is hard to not notice the state of affairs in the world and what we've all been through. So while there may be people out there, there are people out there who are incredibly happy and satisfied with their lives and would not change anything and maybe have excellent health and all the prosperity and abundance that they want. There's probably something that they're carrying that isn't serving them. It just doesn't add up to me considering the prior you know, human generations that have created our, our current society. There's something there. Fascinating. And these are the, yeah. Sorry, were you finished? No, I just was going to put a cherry on top of that is we're kind of in a dark age right now as a people, as a world. And I think that's why these medicines have come up so strongly and are making such a grand appearance on the world stage. It is this natural reaction to what has been happening to our people and to this planet. Something about that. Yeah, fascinating. Great. Is there anything else that needs to be said around plant medicine before we move on? <clears throat> anything to say about plant medicine? Um, well, there's so much. There's so much to say. But I could just encapsulate remaining nuggets. They're not to be taken lightly. They're to be encountered with great reverence, respect, and discernment in preparation. It's best not to go by yourself, to go slow, to take your time. And the best thing you can do in preparation is learn about who you are right now. What has your story been up to that point of you deciding to embark on that journey, that hero's journey? What's your call to action? And... What do you want out of it very clearly? Because you are about to step into an accelerated, catalyzed, intensified state of life itself. And I'm sure we all have had an experience of this when you go about life without a clear why, a clear need. Sometimes you get what you want, sometimes you don't. But when you are certain, you're bound to get there. Or at least information and support comes if you are willing to take it and to equip yourself with that. Yeah, there's a lot more there, but that's the gist of it. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Great information, Kyle. So going back to you growing up without your dad around and not having a, um, a male mentor or role model in the home, how did that experience play out for you? Did you go then seeking a male role model or did mm. you understand that something was missing take us on that journey please yeah <clears throat> i didn't as a youth feel like i had to replace my father or find some surrogate parent i did feel a little out about it at times because many of my friends had both of their parents but it didn't strike me as a as a handicap not until not until much later in my life <clears throat> it first ended up developing into this story that i had to figure it all out myself and woe is me i'm the victim this lone wolf from my family 
with no support and no guidance and taking the weight of the world upon himself. So I get to be upset and frustrated by that. And I deserve all the things that come my way because I've earned them. It kind of turned me into a little bit of a narcissist. I found out shortly before starting my journey at plant medicine, which is kind of what got me into it, that I had this way of putting people around me down so I would be bigger and I would feel worthy and I would feel like I was enough because I never knew what was enough. No one ever set the bar for me. No one ever told me, good job, Kyle. You did it. Well done. That didn't exist for me. So eventually another man did come into my life, like a spiritual father figure and a mentor. And it was after a few years of consciously developing myself with plant medicine the whole stir around why I get into that would be a fun one to talk about, but to stay on topic here with the second father. As all stories and great mythology goes, he came at just the right time, but you can't really see why until you get to look back and spend some time on that path together. But looking back, I can tell you what I was doing at that point I was deeply facing my shadow. Ever since I found out after that first journey with ayahuasca that there were parts of me hurting people that I loved, that I wasn't aware of, that I didn't want to hurt people that I loved, I made a vow. I made a vow like many people in these communities and many of my peers that it ends with me, that we break that curse. And so... I continued upon this, this path, which was quite masochistic. It was a lot of deep, dark work with ayahuasca, along with a deep, dark belief that the medicine work had to be painful because I put people through pain. I had to work through that, and it's going to hurt. And then a man comes along one day after just a devastating weekend of ayahuasca for New Year's. That's how I celebrated the New Year put myself through hell for a couple nights he comes in sunday morning with this tray of dixie cups full of this green powder which was a wachuma cactus uh it's a phenylethylamine it's got similar properties to mdma but it's it's a plant so it's more complex and it lasts all day (laughs) but he had this grin on his face like your friend next door like your uncle none of this highfalutin shamanic appeal or demeanor i'm like what's this guy's deal so i take his medicine and i have one of the most beautiful days of my life and this medicine is about being very much in your body where ayahuasca is like the cosmic exploration of your divine ethereal spiritual self this is the opposite which is why sometimes it's used after ayahuasca for integration being your divine human self singing dancing expressing so after I experienced that, I'm like, what's this man? He's on to something. And then when I heard he was doing a full weekend ceremony with that medicine, just two weeks from that time, I signed up. I went. I showed up fully. And then when I was packing my bags on Sunday night, he comes into the room that I'm in. And at this point, I don't remember the exact words, but I remember what he said in so many words. The gist was he offered himself to me as a spiritual father figure because he said he could see what I was going through that weekend. And he knew that I was missing that, that I didn't have that when I was young. And then from that day forward, we locked arms, but it was on one condition. Because I still didn't know how to just take something and receive it and just be like, thank you. And I'm glad that was me at that point. Because my condition was whatever it is you're doing with this green cactus powder and Dixie cups, I want to help you do it. And he took a beat. He took a moment of silence, locking my eyes. And in that beat, 
I mean, as the years go by, I started to get an idea of what it is he was considering in that moment. But he's like, yeah, I'll do this with you. And ever since then, I've had this man in my corner believing in me, trusting me, supporting me through what feels like lifetimes because I have changed so much because of him. And I've been through so much and I've never felt alone because we made a pact to do this together until the end of our days, no matter what. What a beautiful story. And he's there in Costa Rica, is he? He's in Santa Barbara, which is where we met. Though I've become a bit more of a traveler in these days. And he's visited. Yeah, we stay in touch. I still support our medicine tribe virtually. Yeah, it's still happening. Yeah, so good. Okay. Um, so as an adult, what would you say from, you know, you've touched on bits and pieces already, but the one defining deepest, darkest moment, because you also talk a lot about the hero's journey, which is basically, you know, the, um, what we, you know, the conclusion we come to on a subtle level in the, in this series, you know, from the deepest, darkest moment rising up again. So what was your definitive deepest, darkest moment on your hero's journey so far? Yeah. Well, despite the uh, many I've had, the the deepest, darkest one still remains very clear. It was about about four years ago now. And I had returned from the Amazon. And a little backstory here is prudent. So just before I went on this journey with my then partner, which is a very toxic codependent relationship. I had been betrayed by my business partners and lost everything like I had. I invested all I had into this venture, you know, working in the cannabis industry like everybody else did at some point. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do with myself. I had strayed so far from my original career path. And I felt without purpose for the first time in my life. And that's really hard for a man to be without purpose something to do something to fix problem to solve and so my partner at the time has the wonderful idea of going to the amazon while i'm down and out and i was like no i'm not fit for that i need to find a job i need to find something to do with myself i don't feel well eventually she wore me down and ended up going and they should have turned me away, but they didn't have an intake or any kind of assessment, which was a huge red flag. I wasn't aware of at the time, but something you all should know. And then during the two weeks I spent in the village down there with the Hunikuan, a four day boat ride from the closest third world city in South America, we drank ayahuasca like eight times in two weeks. Great deal. And then massive groups of 200 people just incredibly irresponsible size for a ceremony but everything there was beautiful you know i got all the archetypal visions and downloads and everything was beautiful and supported and just yeah perfect there but when i got back there was no support no integration there was you know, no circles to talk about what we were going through, no advice about what to do, how to reorient back to a very different world and community. And so I started to go down. I started to go down into the ashes, as they would say, and fell deep into anxiety and to depression. Would wake up with thoughts of suicide coming out of my dream space not knowing what to do with myself for hours of the day and feeling helpless and lost because I was being taken care of by my partner, by a woman in the first time of my life, besides my own mother, <clears throat> there was a lot for me to contend with there. 
I tried pharmaceuticals for the first time in my life from my partner. And my body just gave a big no. Like, I can't. I can't do that. This isn't my way through. And I, I just, I suffered. I struggled. The time feels like a blur at this point. All the days seem to like mash together. And I, I didn't know how long it was going to go on for. Like I said, it was about two, two and a half years. And what helped me get through <clears throat> was some really simple advice. My teacher's partner, who had gone through something similar before, she said to me, I hear you. You want to get back on your feet. You want to find a job. You're out there in the job boards. You're calling people. You're making connections. You know, you're trying to be helpful around the house. You feel like you deserve the support from your partner. And I'm not going to say to stop doing that. But I am going to tell you, but before you do any of that any day, I want you to go out to the park. I want you to put yourself on the earth. And do your journaling there. Do your morning routine. Whatever it is you feel like you need to do to keep yourself together. But do it there. And do that until you don't feel like you need to anymore. And the funny thing was when she said that, I could remember countless stories I had heard from people who had gone through dark nights of the soul who essentially said it was the earth that saved me. I just threw myself on the ground and I laid there until I felt better. I'm like, this sounds like some real hippy dippy, you know, sales pitch for whatever it is you're trying to sell me right now. I'm sure it was more complicated than that. But truth be told, that was the one thing that turned it all around. And looking back on it, it makes sense. Now, I was in Oakland at the time. It's a concrete jungle. And I had just come back from like the heart of the mother, like deep in the jungle, one of the most rich and fertile places on the planet. And that got into me. And that depression and anxiety I felt was a healing process. And I want to make that really clear because when a lot of the trauma gets unblocked and shaken up by doing lots of medicine, it's going to express as that first. It's going to feel really painful. It doesn't get right to good. And it's going to look like depression or anxiety because we only have so many labels to like name these things. But it's not the same thing. It's just an energetic imbalance. You feel off because there's something shifting in you. And going back to why we need integration, if that happened in an indigenous tribe, they would pull that person aside. They would care for them. Life be put on hold. You don't need to work. You don't need to do dishes and make food. Like you're healing. Stay with the shaman. You know, stay with the women. And you'd be fine within weeks. But we're not brought up that way. Grin and bear it. Move forward. Drag your guts behind you. So that was still the biggest and darkest night of the soul I went through. Thank you for sharing that. This is a, a key part, isn't it, this integration piece? Because, you know, and I've chatted to other men too through this series, uh, you're number 96, so, you know, we're nearly at the end now. And, you know, there's been quite a few that have mentioned plant medicine. Maybe we haven't gone into the depth that I've got going in now with you. But people are, you know, maybe, well, I if, if I was considering doing plant medicine, I would be interested in maybe, you know, finding out what it involved, you know, the, the qualifications of the teacher, you know, the situation. But often yeah. a piece of integration and aftercare isn't considered or given the importance that you're saying it deserves. So I'd like you to talk to um, people watching men who are considering going on the route of plant medicine and what sh questions should they be asking about this integration piece? A, it's not optional. If they don't offer any kind of integration or support afterwards, just walk away. You can find it and you know, supplement your journey. But if you're about to work with someone who doesn't have it, it means they don't understand the value of it. And that's dangerous. 
You want to ask them how big are their circles? You want to ask them where they got their training. And if they're working with a, a plant medicine, what tribe trained them? And how do they get back to them? Where's the reciprocity? Where's the honoring? What their personal medicine is. And what I mean by that is each practitioner, guide, facilitator, they bring a certain element into that space. If you have the same exact ceremony with two different people, you're having two different ceremonies. Does that make sense? Yeah, because we each have different backgrounds, different spirits, different elementals. If they don't know what they bring, that's also a red flag. They don't know themselves that well. Do they have guardians, if it's a group ceremony, in the space to support? And what are their skill sets? What kind of energy work do they have at their disposal? What's their training? How much time do you spend getting coached beforehand, getting clear on what your goals are, if any at all? Is it a group, individual? Is there an intake? <clears throat> and the same to go with afterward. How much aftercare they provide? How many sessions of integration? How many hours? Um, that's, that's the basics. That's what you would ask them. Yeah. Yeah. Great information. And so important. Thank you, Kyle. From your experience now with the indigenous, um, people of the Amazon, let's talk about masculinity and, um, and the difference between the Indigenous culture there and their views of masculinity and our Western views, what would you say are the differences? Good question. I don't think I can really speak to the differences of what they consider to be masculinity and what we do. I only spent two weeks down there, but I could probably comment to some some basics so they have clear roles and responsibilities in their tribes the huni kuin that i spent time with more of a patriarchy it's led by a man <clears throat> and their shamans and elders their medicine keepers were men and the women cared for the children did the cooking kept the upkeep but I don't know if that's necessarily something that we need to take heed with right now, because I'll just end this part of the description there. With the indigenous right now, when it comes to plant medicines, we kind of fetishize them and we don't understand that they're human too and they have their, their flaws. So while I can't speak in detail around how they view masculinity, I can see how it was accorded and how it showed up. But I can't say that it means it's right simply because they're wisdom keepers of a certain medicine doesn't mean they know the best for how to put a society together. But I will say that as far as masculinity right now in the world goes, you know, we don't have that sharp, vital edge that hunters do anymore. Or we don't have the the chief's essence of discernment and confidence to speak up when something is not going well or to protect someone when they're in danger. That's something that's largely lacking in masculinity these days. And <clears throat> it's coming hot on the heels of a few different swings in masculine expression. Starting back around like the 50s, 60s is a good place to look. You know, that's where like there was the head of household that was the man and he appreciated his wife, but largely for her physical nature, not much appreciation for like the emotionality, the psychology and her unique gifts as a woman. And the gender roles were very clear and stark, but there wasn't a lot of respect for women. Though you can see looking back, things were a little more in harmony like you could raise an entire family in a household of two with the mom staying home and the father working so like something worked out then but there wasn't really good polarity we would call it these days and then sometime shortly after uh, what was it the vietnam war 
I think that was the one where young men started to resist going to war. They didn't see how that made them a man. And they took a stand for peace and for gentleness and for compassion. But that swung all the way in the other direction eventually. And it started to create lopsided relationships of feminine men and masculine women. And for a while, that seemed like the thing. And it was for the time because that gave men an opportunity to learn to listen, to learn to empathize, to learn to speak with care and discernment, generally developing their more inside, their own anima, so to speak. And that was necessary. Shortly after that, was the burgeoning, burgeoning of the New Age movement. So you have these more sensitized, feminine-leaning men coming into spiritual development. And now most of the men who find themselves matriculating in these circles about personal development and personal growth are still quite feminine. But the thing is, they are using that as a badge of honor because they're honoring the feminine or the divine goddess and kind of like prostrating themselves at her feet, but it's too a deficit because a, when you put a woman on a pedestal, she's going to look down on you. First of all, and it just can't be seen the other way. And these men, they hide behind the reverence of the feminine and the respect for her and they use that as a shield as a place to hide to not speak up and to not take action to not protect or defend to not create order out of the chaos and a lot of men are too afraid to do it because we're hot on the heels of the me too movement which has really put a lot of us into a corner of looking at ourselves and like oh well how have I done that to women? Where do I need to look and to heal? And a lot of us do in some way. But now we're getting to a space where, okay, it's safe to come out. It's safe to come out and to be men again. And that's where we're at, where we're inviting men back into their masculinity. So women can take a deep breath and relax because they don't want to be doing the jobs of men. They prove that they can do it. Great. But that's not a quality. That's disparity. That is the equation for an unhappy family unit, mother and father, both working extremely demanding masculine jobs as strangers taking care of your kids. Are you kidding me? That's not the way forward. <laughs> so I think that's where we're at with masculinity these days. And what it looks like for men to support with that balancing is men's work. What is men's work? It's a lot of things, but right now at its core and most base and most fundamental is circling, getting together with men, sitting in a circle, talking about what's happening in your life, what it feels like to be a man, what is challenging for you. Because in doing that, you're learning to trust other men, which means you're learning to trust yourself, which means you're learning about yourself. And further, you start working with men who are trained as men's leaders who know how to bring you through rites of passages and initiations that we have lost then you can start to really understand the mythology of man there's this whole movement called the mythopoetic movement started by robert Bly. i think back in like 50s or 60s don't quote me on that and it was the beginning of the modern men's work movement as we know it in fact it was his work the book Iron John that inspired the Mankind Project, which is the biggest, most well-known organization for men's work in the world. And that book, Iron John, is about essentially the wild man, the green man, the lord of the hunt, if you want to go all the way back to like, primeval times. Yes, we have the king, the warrior, the magician, the lover, excellent archetypes, look at the mature, individuated masculine. But underneath that, where they all spring from, is the wild man. And this is what he wrote about. And what I love about Bly's work and the culture he has created is that for men, it's about understanding the mythology of masculinity. 
the mythopoetic movement is about understanding the stories of masculinity throughout time, how they've come here and what forms they've emerged. Odin, Jesus, Shiva, Buddha, they all have something to teach us, Dionysus particularly. <clears throat> and it's important to notice that that is quite not contrary, but not aligned with what is popular right now as far as men's work is portrayed. And what I mean by that, a lot of the teachers out there who claim to be in a place to help men come into better relationship with women are these polarity teachers like David Dieta and his ilk and John Wineland. And I'm not saying they don't have their place, but I'm saying most men aren't ready to be jumping into a group or like sitting in dyads with women and eye gazing with them because they don't know themselves yet. That's very advanced work. And I think it's far too advanced for the amount of people who are less like rushing headlong into it. We need to get right with ourselves first, then with others, then with community. I think it was Marcus Aurelius that had that right. You know, the, the three circles of community. It's you, nature, others. Right now, men are still at the here spot, getting right with themselves. So entering into a, a compact with the the material and the teachings of the mythopoetic movement and getting into men's circles, I believe, is the most important thing that men can do. And by that token, the most important thing in the world right now, because men take care of themselves. They can get into a right relationship with women. We start doing that. We can build stable family units again. How about that? And then from there, communities that can work together. And then from there, we have a fighting chance to solve the problems in the world. But like many ascenders, as John, uh, as Robert Bly would call them, through their spiritual practice and their spiritual bypassing, they want to go around and above the problem and just go straight to some other place where the issues don't exist. And that's a lot of what's happening in the world right now in the New Age movement in many ways. Yeah, I guess, you know, my idea is that all roads lead up the mountain, just some people take a longer route, you know, because those that are bypassing eventually, the, the spiritual journey, the higher selves will take them in circles until, you know, they hit that rock bottom where they've got to seek something else. Um, mm -hmm. It's my perspective. And of course, as a, a collective, yeah, I can understand that a lot of men aren't ready for the more you know, advanced work and really good to just start with yourself, as you said, you know, like grounding and one-on-one -on -one dealing with um, your own personal issues. Um, for you, what are the, the qualities of the healthy masculine? Qualities of the healthy masculine. <clears throat> Curiosity. Provision, generosity, discernment, clarity of vision, strength in all forms, the mind and the body. I'm going to put faith in there, a belief in something, a higher calling. Courage, for sure. And right now, vulnerability. All right, let's talk about I add that last one. Yeah. Vulnerability. Well, in What's order... your definition and what does that look like in, a, in healthy masculinity? I find vulnerability to be the most powerful and effective trait right now, because without that, circling up as men doesn't go anywhere. So if we're going to get into a circle with men and start talking about your life to these people that you don't really know that well at first, you need to be vulnerable. You need to be able to lean in a bit to that lover side, the lover archetype, which which trusts and feels and expresses. 
without care for being reprimanded or disciplined. It's just like the lover trusts. And that's one of the mature, like masculine facets. And that's the part of man that has been so discarded and put to the side over the past many generations, which is why I believe <clears throat> the vulnerability aspect is front and center right now. Vulnerability is also required to do any deep work, plant medicines or psychedelics, because you don't know where it's going to take you. And if you're closed up and you're not able to surrender and to open to what is happening, you don't you won't get much from it. Yeah, vulnerability. And the more that we practice that with other men in circles and with ourselves in ritual space, the more we can show up that way with our women. And that's incredibly important right now to be able to tell them how we feel. That's the real training grounds these days. Okay, you practice that in a circle. You practice that in ceremony. Can you sit with her and tell her how you're feeling? Can you tell her what you need and not feel any sort of shame in that? It's a, it's a big discussion, isn't it, in the polarity community, this topic of vulnerability. So I'd really like to clarify now how um, men can be vulnerable in union with the feminine while still retaining healthy masculinity what does that look like because there's a discussion of yep tell a woman how you're feeling but don't pour out and do the healing work with her um, there's other extreme polarity teachers mm -hmm. that say men should not be vulnerable at all and then then there's the the feminine expression of vulnerability Where's what do you think is the the healthy medium there with with our men? Hmm. <clears throat> Great question. Well, it's certainly not being the stoic who holds on to all of his pain and silently suffers. That's old hat by now, and it's a big reason why we are where we are as men holding it all, stuffing it down. And it's not being the garrulous, over-processing spiritual new age guy either, because that is going to exhaust and fatigue your woman. So what I have learned to do is, hey buddy, <laughs> new cat, still learning the rules. General rule of thumb for me is when something starts to frustrate me or get under my skin, I allow myself to feel that and just notice what's there. As opposed to jumping right out and having something to say or co-opting someone into a process of making meaning. Oh, you made a comment about this guy, a friend of mine, oh, he looks handsome, so like, I don't need to get up in arms about that right away. But if I notice a pattern, then I can start to put together something to present, something to offer. And I like to do that in a structured way. So one thing I prefer to do in my relationships is have planned dyads. And I know the dyad idea is pretty well known in polarity. Again, I didn't say it's, it's all not helpful but it's like bits and pieces here and there for certain men so if you plan to speak with your woman every evening at a certain time or you know every day of a week at a certain time you both get the relief of knowing there's a space to speak your truth so when things come up that don't feel good you can hold on to them until then that creates a nice clear space for the rest of the time. Another thing to do in that space, in the dyad, is to start with affections and gratitudes. Like give praise to each other for a bit. What you appreciated about this person throughout that day or throughout that week. And then you get into sharing the things that didn't feel so good. And 
this comes down to how you express it. And you can't go wrong with the basic tenets of authentic relating. When you did this, I felt this. And beyond that, you can say, it reminded me of this. And I imagine this because of you doing that. You keep it about you and the I statements. So you're not projecting or blaming or shaming. And women have had enough of that for many, many decades now. Yeah, great advice. Thank you. Uh, we've got about half an hour left, Kyle. I always like to give the men the opportunity to talk about anything else in the episode that I haven't asked about yet. So from your mm. journey and your experience, what would you like to bring into the conversation around men, masculinity, relationships, the healing journey? Yeah, well, <clears throat> it's great. We've touched upon everything that's really important to me. And, you know, for me, all the work I do is really focused on men's work. Like I do the integration coaching. I do the medicine work. All right. Well, what's the, 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 um, in the collective masculinity at the moment, the, the people that are coming to you for men's work, what's the, the predominant issue that our men are suffering with at the moment or, you know, coming to you for healing? That's a good one. <clears throat> what I'm noticing is, a lot of men get stuck. The men that come to me are at a point where they know there's more for them and they don't quite know how to get there or they don't trust themselves enough to do it. Like they need some help and the asking for help is hard and the knowing where to go is hard and how to let go of this whole life that they built you know, because they're in their late 20s, early 30s, usually. And they've got some kind of sticky dependency or addiction, you know, whether it's alcohol or tobacco or marijuana, something's got their claws in them. And they've heard about the success of psychedelics and plant medicine, and they're curious, but they're ready for someone to show them the way. So being stuck, just hitting that plateau. You know, no matter what walk of life men take, they're they're doing pretty good, you know, throughout their 20s, just having a good time. And it's not until like their 30s, mid 30s, they start to hit something. They go into what Robert I would say in the book Iron John, like a catabasis, like something hits on like a depression or like this ancient energy that grabs hold and like pulls them down because they've been doing the wrong thing for too long that doesn't satisfy their soul. They haven't been reading the stories of the greats, of their forebears, of their fathers. They've lived a life without adventure and fantasy for long enough. And that's when spirit comes in and makes it impossible to move forward. Um, I remember. That's how I see it. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And it brought to mind um, a man I interviewed early on who said that well, you're talking about addictions, um, said that it was plant medicine that got him out of pornography addiction. Is it, is it that powerful and is it that black and white? Like, say, let's let's do some practical examples. Say a man comes to you and he's got a pornography addiction and he's wanting yeah. the plant medicine to help him with that issue. How does that play out? Or any addiction? Does it, does it matter what the addiction is? I mean, to a nuanced degree, yes. But essentially, when you're looking at an addiction, it is the externalization of a wound to create connection where it was lacking. So in the preparatory conversations and coaching leading up to the journey, you want to get clear with this person, again, about their story. Figure out when this 
rift happened, who withheld the attention and affection? Was it mom? Was it dad? Or who came in and damaged it through some sort of abuse or violence? The uncle, you know, the babysitter. And then from that point on, you start to get them to tell the story of how life continued and formed and morphed. <clears throat> And what came in, what characters came in, including the pornography, including the multiple relationships that were predicated upon sex only for connection's sake, including the violence and the drugs. All of these external factors, whether it's people or substance or it's addiction to like the behaviors or image, <clears throat> they're all there to be a false sense of connection and and they are their best solution right now. So there's also the framing of like, hey, this is your body and your soul doing its best to take care of you by having this addiction or this control pattern. So you're here because you understand there's a better way. And that's important to like lay the foundation to let them know that there's nothing wrong with what's been happening. It's keeping you alive. And you want something more. You feel like there's a, a time for a shift. That's the call to action. But you get clear in that story. <clears throat> and then you know what kind of energy you're working with. What kind of trauma. And then based upon various conditions in their life. Whether they're on a certain kind of medication. Or have a certain medical history. Um, any physical conditions. Heart conditions. You, you pick a medicine. That will help. Some are really good with PTSD. Some are really great with anxiety and depression. Some of them can just like knock addictions out of the park in one like 48 hour go. <laughs> but yes, I have seen many people be cleared of their pornography dependencies, of their marijuana dependencies. It doesn't just happen. What these medicines do is they show you what to do. They help you feel how you felt. And when you get very clear and very prepared and you have your goals, and you know why you're showing up and who you want to be and what that's going to feel like. And then you have these brilliant, challenging, joyous ego death experiences that are full of archetypes and symbols and wild imagery. <clears throat> we talk about it afterward. The story continues to be woven, except at that point, you get to take all that wild material and make meaning of it in the context of what you talked about in the beginning. So you have three points now. You can continue the story, but these two are very grounded in reality, and this is the amorphous chaos. Without these two, this is nearly meaningless for most people. And from here on, afterward, the integration, this is where all the work takes place. If you don't commit to making sense, cataloging everything that happened, coming up with a plan and executing on it, finding the right community to bring in to support you with that therapist, coach, counselor, and then having the strength and grit to let go of the things that no longer serve you. As your internal world shifts, as it does wildly in those experiences, out here has to shift. And you will be challenged by people who no longer are there to support you. You will be challenged to move to greatly change your environment, your diet. And that, that's the part that gets people through. And if someone doesn't end up kicking their addiction or their habit, it's because they weren't able to do the integration. They didn't have the support and it wasn't offered. And that is far too common in this work, honestly. And that's why you need to be incredibly curious and ask a lot of questions if you're considering it, because it's easy to be let down in this work. It's easy to be led astray it's easy for it to get worse. Right. Great. Yeah. Great insights there. I'm interested in the subject of marijuana because you um, labeled that as an addictive state too. You included it with the list of addictions. Now, a lot of people say, but it's a plant medicine. What's your stance on marijuana <laughs> as an addiction, as a medicine, where where do you stand on the whole subject? Yeah, all right. This is going to make me really unpopular with a lot of people. So 
I'm first going to say I'm not like an expert on marijuana, but I've experienced it in many different ways. And I've worked with a lot of people who consume it in a fashion that is normal, as in to say the way most people do. You know, a couple of times a day, no big deal, helps me sleep, helps me get through work and wind down. Okay. First thing I'll say is the difference between a poison and a medicine is the dose and further the frequency. So something like cannabis, marijuana, it's it's powerful. I just want to say that too. Because we're constantly ingesting things to change our state. You know, our meals do that, but they sustain us. But when you look at what this substance is doing, why it's being used. People use cannabis most often in the standard narrative to take off the edge, to relieve stress, to help them sleep, to check out, to numb out. These are escapes. And if you're escaping from life, if you're using this tool to escape your feelings, multiple times a day, every day, for weeks on end, months, years, you're going to develop a problem. It's not chemically addictive, but anything that changes your mental state, especially if you're using it to avoid what you're feeling, is going to create a psychological dependency. Again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a therapist, I don't have a degree in this, but I've seen it happen so many times. It's just rampant. So, that's possible, and that's happening with a great many people who use cannabis. I would say the vast majority. On the other hand, it is a plant medicine, and used in the correct fashion, it is incredibly transformative and healing and profoundly painful. I have, I have gone through what they call a trans cannabis ceremony. And they call it trans cannabis because it's a transpersonal psychology led cannabis ceremony it was very surprising to me because when i entered that ceremony i was like how are we consuming this i was no cannabis um aficionado at the very least but he's like here's a bowl and i'm going to call in the seven directions and every time i call in a direction i want you to take a hit and i'm like we're just gonna hit this bowl seven times maximum i'm gonna go on like a wild journey Okay, I don't see that happening, but by the time I hit the bowl the fifth time, I didn't even know how I was putting that thing down, or how I was laying back in my mat. And then I went into like a two hour journey that like rivaled the visuals of the most intense DMT experience I'd ever had while I am somatically um, releasing, which is like having a seizure basically for like an hour and a half straight which I didn't know was going to happen beforehand because all the pictures on the website, they're, they're still photos. People look peaceful and lying down, but it relieved a great deal of physical pain in my body. There was a lightness I felt for days afterwards that was profound and it created a deeper relationship with me on a very like visceral level of my body. It's a great somatic medicine. If you use it with intention, if you have like chronic pain and you take an edible or a couple hits off of a you know a bowl and you've got your massage tools nearby and a great playlist and like some some massage oils like you can have a really powerful transformative experience i'm also one of the people that could never have any cannabis in experience pain relief i thought something was wrong with me but there is a a small amount of people, from what I understand, that have a very different relationship with that medicine. Um, I think it's a brain chemistry thing, as far as I can tell, because some people, most people, it relaxes them. It's it's the opposite for me and people like me, uh, whatever that means. But so it's it's yes, it's yes and. But the problem in the world, most people are in a lot of pain. They're anxious. They're depressed. They're not sleeping well. They don't know what to do with these strong feelings. And there's this legal plant medicine that they can just grab in the corner of every city. It's the new booze. It's the new alcohol. And it's being abused beyond I could my imagination, honestly. It's it's the new alcohol, pretty much. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Well, it's legal, I guess, a lot of in a lot of parts of the Americas, but well, I know in Australia it isn't. So interesting to hear what's going on there. Um, there's a couple of other things that I jotted down that I know that um, you're into. So urine therapy, is that right? <laughs> Shivambu. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> Shivambu. Let's talk about that. How does that work? Oh, wow. Okay. So I'll first say that it's been a while since I did all my reading on it and I had the facts really straight, but I can probably still um, regurgitate the, the major tenets of it and why it's helpful. So the essence of urine therapy is that urine is filtered blood, that it is not a waste product. And what's happening and back into the science here. What's happening in your kidneys is that it is removing excess minerals and nutrients. So your blood goes to your kidneys and excess minerals and nutrients get removed. Those excess minerals and nutrients are part of what goes into your urine. So, and of course, excess fluid that you don't need at the time. So basically, your urine is surplus minerals and nutrients in the morning hormones from your evening sleep. So provided that you have a healthy diet, your urine is a superfood. Otherwise, there will be things in your urine if you're eating glyphosate covered vegetables, for example, that will still be toxic. Now, some will say even still it's homeopathic because you keep reintroducing you know, bits of that poison into your body and it's going to develop defenses against it. I haven't used it to that effect because I started urine therapy when I was already on a whole foods diet and eating really well. So there's that part of it. <clears throat> and if you are eating a healthy diet and your urine is simply excess of water, minerals, nutrients, and hormones, you can also use it as a benchmark to see if any new food you introduce into your diet works for you. Because if you eat something that your body doesn't like, which is very personal for everyone's a different relationship with every different food out there. And then you drink the next urine that you pass, if it's like bitter and like, like a bitter medicine, it's probably not a good food for you. Generally, when you're eating on a diet that's working for your body at that point, the taste of your urine is very neutral. In fact, if you do what they call looping, which is drinking every urine you pass throughout the day, um, your urine continues to lose color, becoming more transparent. And they say it gets close to tasting like coconut water. There's more. <laughs> if you take your urine and you put it on your skin, it helps reduce the pain and inflammation of bug bites and stings. Now, most people have heard that you can, when you get a jellyfish sting, I'll pee on it. Yeah, it neutralizes it. Everyone's heard that wives' tale. Well, you extend that. It works for other bites too and um, cuts as well. It can help to disinfect. And let's see what else. You can use it as a nose irrigator. So you get your neti pot. Forget all those fancy expensive salts. You just get some urine and you use your neti pot. I've done that. People claim you can do an enema with it. I haven't gone that far. I'm still with basic enemas still. I've only started those a few months ago. I haven't even tried the green coffee yet. And they say that if you age your urine, it becomes more potent, especially as a, a nasal irrigant and as a topical um, relief from like burns and cuts and bug bites. But then what it ends up doing is... Uh, it develops a sort of ammonia and they say that over time it can crystallize into something that's similar to DMT. I don't know how spurious those claims are. I, I haven't done that myself, but there is an, an amazing book out there. I think it's called the golden fountain. Goodness. I wish I had it. Here okay. so I can we can maybe put it out. in the, in the notes afterwards as, um, as, as a note. 
Uh, where did um, where did it originate from? Like you know, all these all our oh India, India. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good one to touch on. We haven't spoken about that in the series yet. So when I saw it, I was like, yeah, let's get some information on that. And I've also see um, esoteric rune divination. Are you? Ah. A practitioner of that how does that work i'm a bit of an amateur but i've got a bag of runes and that has come from an interest in that part of my my heritage my father's like eastern european german swedish polish and i've always had a fascination with norse culture simply because they've always seemed to me so reverent of the earth I didn't get so caught up in like the paganism, witchcraft, and the rebellious people that that seems to, you know, draw in. But to me, it was more like mm, the strength that these cultures held and this deep mystical relationship with the earth. And they loved mushrooms and Nina Muscaria, particularly, which is something I'm starting to develop a relationship with. So the runes really spoke to me because they're they're archetypes so unlike tarot and other divination decks that are predicated upon certain characters um in certain like phases in life archetypes are very elemental like for example the mountain is an archetype what does it represent to you what does it mean with the runes, each rune is not only a letter of the alphabet, but it represents certain aspects of humanity, of nature, and it's also a spell. So like you have an entire culture wrapped up in this magical language. And beyond that, the Norse people, their gods, Odin and his ilk, while most would see them as these wild, barbaric, infighting families of elves and giants and gods, which isn't untrue, they also were very artistic. And above all, they praised poetry, the power of word. They really understood the power of word. In fact, Odin, one of his greatest tales is that he was seeking knowledge of the world of life itself and he found his way to the base of yggdrasil which is the world tree which connects the heavens to the underworld and the middle is the world of mankind midgard he went to the, the roots the base of this tree which opens up to this well with three norns in it these mystical feminine water dwelling creatures that know all and he's trying to bargain with them. He's like, I want the, the knowledge of the world. I need this, the feminine mysteries to complete myself as a god. And they're like, offer us something. So he hangs himself from the roots of the tree for seven days and seven nights. And after that, when they're still not satisfied, he plucks out his eye, gives them his left eye. And then they're like, okay, that'll do. That's why Odin is one-eyed. But then he was given the power of the runes, the power of words the power of poetry. And if you look at, say, Christianity, for example, although all religions and traditions go back to this essence, logos, for example, you know, speaking, expressing, that's how we create our reality. The Norse people knew this. And that's what I love about them. They're really tapped into the mysteries of the world. And they're still very core they're very much here in the elements like living in the frozen tundras and communing with mushrooms and being very human very balanced very grounded that's what i appreciate about them great story there so i mean you know i've got to ask this question because you know i'm so into poetry and so what's the difference between what's the power of poetry as a power as opposed to the power of the word and words that aren't poetry what what's the key about poetry hmm. 
I don't know if I have an answer for that. But what I can say is there is this, to go back to another Norse tale. So there's this artifact called the Mead of Poetry, which was created out of one of these gods who knew everything. And he was trapped by these two really clever dwarves, trapped and killed and like burned and cooked into a mead, into like his blood was put into a mead. And Odin's like, well, that's awful. You you killed one of my gods, so I'm gonna come and steal it back. And like by him drinking that blood mead, it gave him the power of poetry. So what's the difference between just the word and the poetry? Well, I would imagine it's because they also value art. Because yes, you can speak clearly and plainly with word and be direct and precise, but there's something boring about that. And if you look at any of the ways that Odin speaks throughout, you know, the Eddas or the sagas, um, it's all in like this very articulate and creative verse and prose. So it's almost like there's a balance there between the masculine and feminine aspects of creation. There's the container, which are the words themselves, but there's also like the beauty and the art of the poetry. I'm making a, a reach here. I'm not saying that's the answer, but that's what works for me. I love it. I love it so much. Thank you. <laughs> Made my day. Oh. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's start wrapping up, Kyle. It's been such a fascinating um, interview with so many topics that we've um, covered that, you know, brought new information into the series. So thank you for that. So first of all, where can people find you? And um, then I'll ask you to deliver a final message for men, please. You can find me on Instagram. Um, at Kyle, K-H-I-E-L dot anchor, A-N-K-E-R. And a final message okay, for men. I'll put your Instagram link underneath. You've also got Facebook links, so um, I'll add those too. And yes. if you think of any other links or any recommended reading, um, if you could send that through and we'll put that all uh, in the information below when I when I upload. Um, yeah, the final message to men, men that are maybe at that rock bottom moment, that lost um, moment, what have you got to say to those men? How can you light up their path and bring them some hope for um, their hero's journey? Yeah, for those men who are finding themselves stuck and yeah, that spirit is trying to bring you back to your nature, to your adventure, to the radiance of your soul. You got to get back in touch with your story. You have to get back in touch with the adventure of life. And this isn't from the inner child, wonder, play, innocence place. It's from the actual nature of our being, which is the joy of exploration, of growth, of service, of mission through purpose. But to get there, you need to start men's work. You got to start circling with men. You got to read the books about the mythology of men. Pick up the book Iron John. Pick up King Warrior Magician Lover. We'll put those in the show notes. Start remembering your story and then telling it to other men. So good. Thank you, Kyle. Well, thank you. And I want to make a special mention, a special. Um, gratitude to Kyle because this is actually the second time we've um, recorded this interview the first time we went for about half an hour and I was having big um, internet issues when I first moved a, a few weeks ago so very grateful that Kyle rescheduled and we got to hear all his fascinating wisdom about plant medicine and about his journey so much appreciation thank you Kyle thank you Gemma it's been a pleasure to share <laughs> everyone if you could like share subscribe and i'll be back next week with another episode of heart warriors thank you
could stay on, please, Kyle. 